All right, well, we'll get things started. So, um, hello, uh, everyone. I wanted to welcome you to our first webinar in the 2021 Earth Science Information Partners Innovation Webinar Series. Um, this series follows ESIP's theme for 2021 of leading innovation in Earth Science data frontiers. We are delighted to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Quan Collins, Master Solutions Architect at SAIC. If you're not familiar with ESIP, I wanna welcome you. We are so glad you're here. Allow me to give you a quick introduction. ESIP strives to be a leader promoting the collection, stewardship, use and reuse of earth science data, information and knowledge that is responsive to societal needs. For more than 20 years, ESIP has helped members of the earth science data community find each other across traditional boundaries to leverage each other's expertise and work together on common data challenges and opportunities. ESIP fosters rich collaborative experiences through our primary three approaches. These are virtual collaboration, meetings, and the ESIP lab. The ESIP lab supports in the development of innovative applied earth science technologies and our meetings each year, twice each year, um, bring together the entire community. Our virtual collaboration happens throughout the year um, with our 28 collaboration areas that come together around a variety of technical and applied data challenges. You can see our next meeting will be in July and it will be virtual again. Um, so hopefully that makes it easy for as many people to participate as possible. Registration will be open soon and the call for session proposals is out now. We will feature upwards of 50 community contributed breakout sessions a great lineup of plenary speakers, and numerous networking opportunities, even online. So what does our theme for 2021 really mean? Uh, leading innovation in earth science data frontiers. This will be our theme for the entire year and including this webinar series. In the rapidly changing and evolving fields of both earth science and data management, our knowledge and understanding of the latest innovations and breakthroughs is essential to continue to advance our work and leverage what is possible. As a community, ESIP participants use collaborative problem solving to support each other by sharing and exploring new research, methods, tools, and approaches. Together through this intentional work, we support those working at the frontier, the cutting edge. Working at frontiers can feel scary. It can feel unsupported, lacking in resources and in answers. Through the ESIP community, we can drive a culture of innovation, supporting those at the frontier and enriching the entire community by sharing advancements. This webinar series explores examples of innovation, stories of developments that may or may not have seen innovated at the time, but were definitely innovative in retrospect, and examples of what innovations are needed in the future from a variety of perspectives. I am glad you are here and I hope you will join with us on this journey. I am really grateful for SAIC's sponsorship of this webinar series throughout the year. As you know, and as I suspect Dr. Collins will demonstrate, SAIC is a premier technology integrator solving our nation's most complex modernization and readiness challenges across the defense space, civilian and intelligence markets. We are excited to have them as a new ESIP partner and a sponsor. Now I'll pass it over to ESIP's community director, Megan Carter, to introduce our speaker for today. Thanks so much, Susan. Uh, like she said, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Quan Collins, who is a master solutions architect in the civil space at SAIC. She is recognized as a technical expert and resource in digital transformation, IT modernization, specialized engineering, intelligent software, and analytics areas. She has led the senior soft solutions architects team and develops intelligent software solutions for insights and action plans from disparate, da disparate data sources through data-driven and artificial intelligence methods for all customer groups and strategic bids. She draws on her judgment and expertise in the field's concepts, practices, and procedures, which are derived from a PhD and 23 years of experience to develop technical strategies, architectures, and roadmaps, as well as to solve complex total system problems for intelligent software and analytics customers. 
Dr. Collins is a mentor at the Capital Factory, which helps startups to understand how to do business with system integrators and the federal government. She is also adjunct faculty at the University of Maryland Global Campus School of Business, where she teaches big data, evidence-based methods and analytics and practice. She serves on the board for the Austin Forum for Technology and Society and Austin Smart Cities Alliance. We are delighted to have Dr. Collins here today. Um, a quick note for all of you on the call, if you have questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box and we will address them as time allows at the end. And now I will pass it on to you, Dr. Collins. Thank you so much, Megan, for that awesome introduction. And thank you, Susan, as well, and uh, to Tim for uh, the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Let me share my screen. Megan, verify for me that uh, the slides look good. Looks awesome. Awesome. So I love this theme. I love everything that you guys are doing and what Susan talked about. I think, uh, you know, uh, is you guys are embodying, right, what it means to be an innovative community. And I know so much about the earth science community and, and the folks that are doing work in the space. So a lot of what I want to talk about today is reinforcing things that I think are already happening, but continuing to reinforce the need for us to think as globally as possible when it comes to innovation uh, for all of us, uh, all the stakeholders in the community to work as effectively together and uh, think through creatively the different techniques that we can adopt to maintain our culture of innovation that we all want, um, especially in the context of earth science. So more than ever this last year, I think has taught us so much about the need to be innovative, right? And to uh, be able to adapt in the face of the global pandemic, uh, economic disruption, right, civil unrest, and all these technologies that are available uh, to us to help with continuing to work, right? Just simple things like NASA, you know, having to figure out how to move the entire workforce to a remote, uh, to a remote setting and ensuring that all the network, all the data all the infrastructure could support the, the workforce in that context. Um, in commercial, in our homes, right, there's this increasing expectation um, for the higher quality of customer service, right, and the delivery of these digital services um, at speed and needing to have that similar experience in your workplace. And so that's sort of been driving the need for us to be able to bring these emerging technologies to the workplace so that we can continue to retain, recruit the best talent for all of our agencies, for all of our communities, um, because that talent is required also, right, for us to adopt these new technologies and maintain this culture of innovation that we all want. So, you know, all of this to say that um, we need to think uh, and continue to uh, evaluate all of the, the, the ways that we're doing things um, and question what we know, right, because the hardest thing to do is to change what we believe we know um, and so that's part of what the what we'll talk about today is uh, is challenging you know those those concepts. Um, and I love this quote that I saw from uh, one of the DoD Platform One social media posts that the most dangerous phrase in the language is that we've always done this this way, right? And we tend sometimes to to lean on what we know, uh, which which can uh, hinder innovation. So part of the talk was, uh, you know, in my title talked about this idea of the future uh, state of innovation, right? The future of what it means to be innovative and this idea of an innovation ecosystem stakeholder model um, has come up and I put the citation there from the uh, MIT Sloan Business School. So in the past, right, we've talked about the triple helix where we've got academia, government, industry working together. Um, and that's, that worked well for us uh, for a point. And this new model has emerged where we want to accelerate, right? We want to go faster. And what happens in larger organizations, right, is it becomes a little bit harder to do that because of compliance issues, security issues, very important things. However, we need to figure out how do we start to break that organization down, break that bureaucracy down so that we can continue to innovate at the speed that we know we need to. So this idea of working with startups and smaller companies um, and expanding uh, sort of the stakeholder model, uh, working with accelerators and incubators and creating this broader context of how we do business, 
and how do we not only leverage what we have with academia and large business and government um, and also infuse um, what the startup culture can bring to us, which is that failing fast, right? Closing the loop, focusing on outcomes, pivoting when we need to, when we need to make a change. Um, so I want you guys to think about this as we, as we think about the methodologies and the frameworks and the activities that we want to do, um, and also the investment, right? One of the things that a lot of government agencies are noticing is that we, uh, because of our bureaucracies, because of our inability sometimes to utilize startup technologies or even like, um, you know, new research that's emerging, uh, we need to think differently about everything that we're doing in the organization and support these communities that are doing and behaving in the ways that we want to behave. Um, so we'll talk about that further as we go here. So facilities and where we work, obviously in the context of the global pandemic, um, you know, the future of where we work is going to change, right? And I know that all of our organizations are thinking through that in particular with SAIC, that we're probably going to have a new normal, right? Where we still work, um, you know, somewhat remotely, but we do know that with innovation and for real collaboration, we need opportunities to, uh, to have that interaction, right? And to come together. And even when you look across history, across, you know, across different domains like artists and writers, um, there was a need to go off, work on your own, but then to come back to a community and share that knowledge, share that information and get the feedback of how, how well we've been um, innovating and coming up with new ideas. So when we think about um, sort of where this innovation happens and what kinds of activities we want to encourage, right? We know we need to consider outreach and support, right? And, and thinking about how we uh, reach out to even folks outside of our domain of expertise because we can learn from other communities about how to innovate. Ideation and collaboration. So finding opportunities for, in this case, earth scientists, right? To, to share that information. And I know through ESIP, you know, and just even being here on this webinar, we're thinking, um, you know, we're learning together, we're sharing ideas together, but making that, you know, uh, different levels of that, right? At large scale conferences, smaller regional workshops, even in your own organizations, bringing that collaboration and that stakeholder group together. Training, with all of these emerging technologies, uh, there is a need to continue to learn and upskill and retrain. And so ensuring that we're planning for those types of things, learning the new methodologies, learning the new technologies, and uh, having opportunities then under the relentless innovation piece to now practice it. Because it's one thing to learn it in an environment. I was just training a group of uh, NASA civil servants yesterday and, you know, the, the academic is great. And there was a comment that said, you know, I love it when we have these training classes, but then how do we ensure that we, we have the next step, right? The ways to practice and, and get hands-on experience with it. So having um, investment opportunities, lab, in, uh, lab environments um, where the workforce can engage and practice the new skills and figure out in the context of the problems that they're trying to solve, how to best pull that together. So at SAIC, we're certainly constantly trying to figure this out, figure out new frameworks. And certainly, um, you know, when we talk about an innovation stakeholder model, we are investing in not only facilities, but in startup accelerators like T-Rex in St. Louis and uh, Capital Factory in Austin, which is where I, I live currently, uh, the Technology Integration Gateway in Cookville, Tennessee, Catalyst Campus out at Colorado Springs, and all of these are intended to immerse our workforce, our customers, and the technology community in the location that we're in um, to spur on the, that ideation, that collaboration, and that constant learning and outreach into the community. And that stakeholder uh, model, you know, it cannot be understated in terms of its importance in creating this culture of innovation and figuring out the ways that we accelerate and bring that velocity and cadence uh, to our dialogue. So just from a, um, you know, what are the things that we're talking about, uh, you know, when it comes to the technology side of innovation and also from the methodology side. And, you know, I've changed this multiple times. I think you guys could probably come up with another 
grouping of technologies as well. Uh, but as we think about what the emerging technologies as we know them today, it's certainly about cloud, right? Cloud adoption, how do we continue to leverage the power of the cloud? Um, and you know, the, the three big uh, cloud providers, uh, Google, uh, certainly a huge player in the earth science community, Amazon Web Services as well, Azure, um, the amount of services, I mean, there's just so much that it brings to the table and learning how to um, effectively utilize all of those services securely as well, right? And in our problems uh, is very important. Customer service, I mentioned early on, right, in terms of that expectation that our user community has and even our workforce has in the level of service that we get out of the tools and platforms that we're creating again, cannot be understated. Because if we, if we put out a product, we create a platform, we create an environment, and it's not intuitive, it's not easy to use, um, and it doesn't integrate with other tools that we want to use in the environment, it quickly becomes something that you know, uh, does not get utilized, right? So the adoption rate is low. And then in some cases, right, our perception might be, well, you know, we tried that, it didn't work, right? I, I've heard over and over again, like we, we, we tried the cloud and it didn't do what it was supposed to do. Well, you know, was it the technology or was it the way that we implemented it? And was it the, because the interface was not, uh, you know, intuitive? Security, we, we're never gonna get away from that, especially in today's environment. So ensuring that we have that at the forefront, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about integrating the, the silos, right? And security needs to be involved up front so that we can um, make that as, as seamless and transparent to the process as possible and embedded in the process. Intelligent software and analytics, a huge area of innovation, um, not only from the perspective of what we can do with the data. I know certainly in the earth science community, data is a huge part of what we do. Um, but even in how do we use the data to identify new ways of innovating? Right, so there's multiple ways that we can view the data and use the data in the context of innovation. And then infrastructure optimization, right? Ensuring that we, we are looking at the holistic infrastructure and making sure that we are modernizing as much as we can where it's relevant. Um, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, big bang things. We don't have to migrate everything into the cloud, uh, but where we can and where we can optimize and upgrade our, our equipment. Um, that's important to consider and plan for, certainly from a funding perspective. And then underpinning all of these uh, technologies are the methodologies that uh, are available to us to ensure that we can effectively utilize the technologies, adopt them, um, and make them part of, you know, inherent to the work that we're doing. Certainly from an IT perspective, I've got, you know, I told before, where now IT service management has infused Agile and DevSecOps into the way that we're delivering infrastructure, right? So everything is becoming much more software defined, software oriented. And so all of these software methodologies are influencing the delivery of infrastructure even. Uh, Model-based systems engineering and just digital engineering in general, right? So looking at our requirements, how we're architecting things, making sure that our data is shared in an appropriate way so that we're not reinventing architectures, you know, every single time that we have a new problem that we're trying to solve. Scaled agile, lean agile portfolio management um, certainly is, is fundamental. We'll be talking about too in terms of rapid prototyping and accelerating the rate at which we are pushing out uh, capabilities. And then DevSecOps is that umbrella culture and movement and methodologies that, you know, DevSecOps infuses uh, to ensure that we are moving at that, that velocity and cadence. Um, Megan mentioned my involvement in smart cities. Um, sorry, I went a little bit faster. Um, and so it's important for us to think about the context of smart cities, right? So this brings together IoT, 5G, AI, all the problems with data. And as we think about earth science problems, I mean, it's almost like a smart planet problem, right? And how do we how do we look at all of the data collectors and uh, technologies that we're bringing together uh, to work effectively, so that the consumer, right, can can effectively use that data? And so I know this community has talked about analytic and analysis ready data, right, and creating these environments where we can easily uh, create the, that type of data. 
uh, so that we can use it and, and do the things that we want to do, whether it's uh, you know, in unified forecasting or looking at atmospheric and, and uh, earth models, um, and how do we bring all of those scientific communities together to use that data more effectively? So there's areas in smart city, you know, that study of smart cities that we can leverage. So I've mentioned DevOps a couple times. I won't go into this in, in a ton of detail, but I think, you know, most of you understand, right? It's, it's not one thing. It's an organizational and a cultural movement. Um, it's about leveraging what we've learned in, in the software delivery uh, about velocity, improving service reliability, building that shared ownership among the stakeholders, right? So we mentioned that innovation stakeholder model and um, DevOps really facilitates us thinking about this in a holistic end-to-end -end way. Everything from how do we develop the thing, the product, the artifact, and how do we bring it into operations, bring it to our customers as quickly as possible. This is just more reference in terms of, you know, if you want to get more into DevSecOps, there's hand, handbooks and books and tons of uh, publications in the body of knowledge that the DevOps Institute manages uh, to learn more about how we build this world-class environment. And I argue that this applies to earth science completely. Um, and if we think about it in terms of the whole earth science community, from the domain experts, the scientists, the data scientists, the IT you know, uh, infrastructure providers, we need that community to work uh, in a lot more holistic way um, and continue to innovate in terms of how we work together uh, so that we can bring that speed to, to the culture. Um, and so there's DevOps and then there's DevSecOps where we're infusing and embedding security into what we're talking about. Um, so it's important to ensure as I mentioned earlier, right, that we're involving security up front because that tends to be, you know, the reasons why we, we can't bring the product to the, the community as quickly as possible. So uh, ways that we can be creative uh, with modularizing uh, security and looking at how do we infuse them into the organization uh, as opposed to being sort of that checkpoint after the fact. When we think about these values, uh, you know, the DevOps values, they certainly apply to what we're talking about, you know, in terms of innovation and, and what we need in order to create the culture and maintain the culture that we want. Um, so culture, it's, you know, embedded in what we're talking about. Um, as we think about, you know, the agile teams, um, you know, this is all about working better together uh, to build, deliver, operate the solution. And it's also about, you know, the, the who's in that team, right? So it shouldn't just be, the engineers or the scientists or the IT. It's about bringing that cross-function uh, fun functional team together and then looking across all of the teams to ensure at, at an enterprise and global level that we're continuing to work together in that agile uh, way. Automation, wherever we can provide automation to help with developing that analysis-ready data with, uh, you know, standing up containers in the cloud, not everybody is going to be, you know, sort of the cloud expert or the data science expert, but we want to create environments where we can have, uh, you know, we can coin a new term today, the citizen earth science scientists, right, where um, you can go into these environments, do the things you need to do, provide the code, and share it in a way that's uh, relevant to the, to the other folks that are going to be um, uh, looking at that, evaluating it, finding ways to automate that evaluation of the code as well, wherever possible, uh, so that we can quickly share and get to the outcome that we're trying to achieve with these models. Um, lean flow, so looking at ways that we can continue to break down the problems that we're trying to solve um, so that we get um, you know, faster uh, outcomes and get that feedback and continue to innovate and improve upon what we're doing. Um, you know, we've seen over and over again that, you know, if we can um, break down the problem into small enough batch sizes, this is how we get the speed and innovation that we're looking for. Measurement, very important, right? We're not going to get what we want until we know what we're measuring and we can validate this. I don't need to tell this to the scientific community here, uh, but validation is very important here to understand what we are measuring and, and validating that we're doing what we said we were going to do. And then finally, sharing. Uh, we need to figure out better ways to share. And um, you know, I think that we're doing it, certainly with communities like ESIP, 
um, but more broadly and in the programs you know that we're we're developing whether it's at NASA or NOAA just continuing to break down the silos wherever possible um, because there's so many groups of people that are doing amazing work and the more that we can find each other and share that information uh, the quicker we can go. So the benefit to this community is more transparency, right? Increased productivity and efficiency, uh, better insight into how this work can flow from community to community, and certainly better collaboration across all of the stakeholders. So we talked a lot about this already, focusing on the business side, right? We wanna win through innovation and Agile and Lean DevSecOps certainly helps us with this continuous delivery model, right? We want to continue to bring new ideas, improve our models to the community. And this is, this is the methodology to get it done. Um, and a lot of this is not new, right? I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, yeah, we do some of this already. Um, and it's not to say that we're doing things wrong or that you know, we need to scrap everything that we're doing and start over, but it's, I guess, the, the scale at which we're thinking about it and the broadness who we're considering as part of the the community and the teams that we're working uh, with. And that sort of changes things a little bit, right? Um, and we have to start where we are. So the fact that we're already doing some of this is great. Um, we wanna continue to build on that and improve uh, the way that we're, we're interacting together and how we're doing that. Um, and so there's always this tension, right? Between uh, too much focus on too much change and also this uh, hyper focus sometimes on stability especially in you know, things like the unified forecasting model. We can't break models completely, but we want to still infuse the innovation and the new thinking from the community. So we need to find that balance, right? The business and from a, from a customer value, a stakeholder value perspective, we want both, right? We want change and we want stability. So some of the ways that we can do this within a DevSecOps model, right? We talked about, um, we talk about these three ways and, and I like, the sort of uh, the, the incremental buildup of, of the ways and how it works together. So with first way, we're talking about that systemic thinking, systems thinking, improving flow. Um, so while I think that this is done in a lot of spaces, I think again, it's just about the, the scale at which we're thinking about it from you know, um, the, the lowest level trigger and demand from the environment to how we are bringing value to the community. And how do we optimize across that uh, value stream? The second way is all about feedback. How are we getting feedback? And are we making it easy to get that feedback? You know, using things like chat ops and social media and Slack and things like that, and broadening again the community at which that, that's providing that feedback is important for continuous improvement. And then finally, with the third way is this idea of just continuing to experiment and learn and not just from the domain area that we are uh, experts in, right? Reaching out to other domain areas because we can learn. And sometimes it's easier to look at innovation from sort of that external perspective. So involving other communities uh, might help to see the problem a little bit differently because sometimes we're just too close to the problem to see where we can find creative ways to change it. So here's the typical deployment pipeline, right, with, uh, with DevSecOps, um, but thinking about it from the perspective of how do we create platforms, integrated tools, so that we can continuously integrate, test, stage, and have environments where it is always ready in terms of uh, being released to your consumer, to your customer. Um, and so this is, this is fundamentally what we're trying to do. I know with, uh, NOAA and the unified forecasting community and, and what we're doing with EPIC. Um, a lot of this is applicable there where uh, NOAA wants to create right this public uh, cloud environment where scientists can easily come in to share the code. Um, and so all of this, this methodology and, and thinking through that pipeline is fundamental to that, uh, you know, making that research to operations, operations to research pipeline flow. So I mentioned DevOps, right, is the infusion of all of these methodologies and, and we can add to this, right, in terms of what's relevant to the earth science community. Um, and what I like about this then, it, it's, it's what we talked about earlier. It's not about we, we've been doing it wrong, we need to scrap what we're doing, but how do we do a better job 
of integrating all of these methodologies together so that they work in concert with each other, right? And it's not sort of the serial, we are doing Agile here and we're doing ITSM here and we're doing you know, safety culture here, but we're bringing it together to make the work more fluid and more um, and quicker. And so the Agile Manifesto also informs, you know, what we should be valuing here, right? It's, it's the individual interactions. How do we continue to improve that over focus, focusing on process and tools? We want working software over comprehensive documentation. We want more collaboration with the stakeholders over focusing on, you know, contract negotiations. And bottom line, we want to be able to quickly respond to change over following the plan. And I think all of us, you know, we, we understand this inherently, but we can all see where, um, you know, based on what I talked about and breaking down what we know, uh, sometimes can lean on the right-hand side, which is not to say that those things aren't important, but they, they do sort of hinder uh, us moving faster and innovating. So we need, a, we need to continue to shift the culture. I think this community has done a great job with, with being innovative and with creating a culture of collaboration, but we can always do better, right? So this is about being in that mode where we are constantly evaluating, are we doing the best we can to improve uh, the way that we are collaborating and the way that we're sharing information? We wanna break down silos as much as possible between all of the stakeholders in the community um, to improve you know, that interaction. And I just need to think about skills a little bit differently, right? Think about the new roles and the new teams that we need in order to build this environment. Um, and so this is one view of it, right? Where we think about, um, you know, not your typical, we have security, we have uh, your database, your applications, your end users, um, but have this sort of uh, merged DevSecOps team um, that's working on a specific product um, and so there's a lot more cross, uh, cross skilling, cross domain understanding of the problem, um, still maintaining that individual sort of uh, accountability, right? Because at the end of the day, the person's individual still needs to deliver the job that they're there for, but it's more of a shared understanding and a shared accountability across all of the domain areas so that we're, you know, in the what we're building, we're considering everybody else's requirements and needs as well. Lots of organizations across the federal agency are moving into this environment. Um, and for the reasons that we all want this improved, accelerated, innovative uh, area. So Kessel Run from the Air Force and uh, the DOD, the Navy, uh, NASA, NOAA. I mean, everybody is looking at how to move in this direction. Um, and with this idea of a continuous ATO, right? So that's that infusion of security so that we have authority to operate, you know, and it takes hours versus, you know, weeks or months to get the new product out there. The analytics framework, I know this is something that all of you know, and I'm, I don't mean to, to preach this at all, but, you know, when we think about that analysis ready data, um, it's important to sort of go back to fundamentals sometimes and think about the types of data that we're collecting and, you know, what's the appropriate mix of uh, technology applied to that data? And are we making sure that we have appropriately um, uh, infused, ingested, cleansed the data upfront, manage that data, the sort of the non-trivial, but the not really exciting part of the data anal analysis piece of this? Um, and then where do we need human input to still be part of how do we um, understand what we are integrating together? Because sometimes, you know, if it's such a complex uh, problem, uh, human input is still quite critical in that, uh, in that process. And so rapid prototyping, you know, um, going faster, being able to pilot these technologies, having the space and the environment to do that is very important so that we can continue to learn. Um, you know, we, we can't change completely like all of the systems that we're operating today. But if we can have environments that are very close to production environments, um, we can learn, you know, what's going to be appropriate. Because all of these tools, some of them are so, you know, they're so new to the environment that we really don't even know if they're appropriate. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we, 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 can't, we shouldn't test them or we shouldn't learn more about them. 
uh, but we need that time and space and environment to test them out um, and in the right context, right? Um, uh, solving the problem. Sometimes I know with um, new technologies, right? You see it and you don't even know you need it because you are not seeing it in the right context, right? So it's easy to sort of brush it aside and say, well, I, you know, we're not ready for that yet. But we don't know because we're not putting it in the right context yet. Um, so we need environments where we can test it out in context and with, uh, with the right problem uh, construct, if you will. Um, I'm just checking on time to make sure I, I leave enough time for questions. Uh, so we talked about agile teams. And then we need sort of this uh, super agile team, if you will, that's sort of looking at the aggregate, right? So I mentioned like needing to uh, look from end to end and broaden, uh, you know, the stakeholder community that we're involved in. So not only do we need to operate in an agile way in our own organizations, but as we think about all the stakeholders and other organizations that we're interfacing with, how do we create that agility across the community? Um, and create events where our, our activities are synchronized. I mean, that would be sort of the nirvana, right? Where we're coming together in these conferences and not only are we just you know, sharing the outputs of our, of our work, but we now know like even intrinsically how they're connected and now how do we quickly tie those together to advance the, the state of uh, our understanding of the problem you know, that we're trying to solve. And you know that interaction, obviously, like we can we can iterate together, but we can completely be out of sync with each other, right? And and we don't know how to uh, how to do that integration without spending a lot of time that and resources that we may not have. But if we can find ways to be more synchronized um, and utilize the opportunities that we do have, uh, you know, we might be able to find pockets where you know, we can see those uh, relationships and merge systems that we're using together uh, to bring those technologies together and ideas. So just some ideas on how to, um, you know, to, to have this conversation through workshops, um, you know, definitely setting the business context is important up front, um, setting the vision for what we're trying to accomplish, and then breaking out into our communities of practice and groups to solve and then come back together to quickly get that feedback of whether or not we're hitting uh, the mark. Um, I think some of this is about like vocabulary, like how can we define the problems so that we are speaking the same language? And a lot of times that's very, you know, that's easier said than done. But when we talk about needing analysis ready data, have we defined that sufficiently enough in the even the earth science domain communities um, so that when we come back together to share information, uh, we know how, uh, how to proceed forward, right? And, and how to bring those pieces together. Kanban is just another tool that's easy to visualize the flow of work, right? And if we can come up with like, again, a community version of this uh, to see where communities are working and where even at, at thematic levels, right? We can bring people together um, that would be very exciting. Uh, more on just how we plan for these outcomes, right? And, and, and look at uh, the, the overall backlog, if you will, and what are the top 10 priorities for the community? You know, it'd be really cool, potentially, you know, something we could start in ESIP um, to, to start to think about that, right? In terms of, um, you know, building on the communities that we already have, and how do we now share you know, our priorities and, and come up with a top 10 uh, for the ESIP community? I put together this just very quickly. And so you know, some of you might argue about what the steps are, but this was just looking across you know, the different ways of, of uh, visualizing your value stream. Um, so you have your operational value stream at the top, which gets you to the outcome that you're trying to achieve for the, the community. And then what are the systems that are supporting those steps in order to achieve that outcome? And sometimes we muddle the two, right? We talk about the systems in the context of what we're trying to achieve in terms of an operational problem. And sometimes it helps to separate that because there might be opportunities within uh, the development side that we can merge systems, right? To help with accelerating what we want to do on the operational side. 
Um, and I see that this is where sort of that analysis ready data piece can come into play to help the community with, with sharing more of that. And then, um, you know, we can, solutions will emerge as we merge those systems together and where these people are located and the problems that they're trying to solve. Um, so just visualizing the problems in different ways sometimes can be a way to see where the innovation uh, will emerge. More just about visualizing your requirements and how we can plan for where we have that common ground for innovation. And then always coming back to the business value. Um, and this is where we have that opportunity to pivot. Did we accomplish the thing that we came here to do? And if we're not, let's stop doing it. Sometimes, you know, I know we tend to want to keep hammering at the problem. And sometimes it's just, uh, we need to stop, right? And think about it a different way. And so if that's part and inherent to the way that we're doing the work, uh, then it just becomes, you know, a practice um, and something that we do naturally. Um, more on sort of the bringing those iterations together across the different stakeholders. And again, these are just placeholders. You know, you could imagine from an earth science perspective, all of the different, you know, community, communities that are building models, whether it's, you know, for atmosphere or, you know, oceans or whatever. Um, and, and where do we have the opportunities to merge our, our, our concepts and, and projects together at that global scale perspective? more on how you might uh, look at the planning. And the point here is to continue, you know, this has to be a continuous thing. This can't just be, you know, we do this once a year or we do this once a month even, right? It should become just part of the cadence of doing work in this community. Um, and in a lot of cases it's happening, I think, um, in, in most communities, especially Earth, the earth science community, however, um, we want to just look at opportunities to bring more of our activities together um, and how do we, we do a better job with sharing across those communities. Um, other ways to think about, you know, um, this acceleration of your, your innovation model, right, bringing together, you know, certainly having scoping sessions uh, where we can talk about how do we define, how are we defining the problems that we're trying to solve and can we agree on that prioritized list of problems um, having that incubation workshop where we can do the visioning, figuring out the alternatives, um, and then certainly the uh, business and IT, and then the, uh, the outcomes piece, right? So making sure that we're always focused on the outcome and making sure that we're demonstrating that outcome. And finally, you know, more on the training of the workforce, because I think it, it cannot be understated that it's not just about even understanding your domain area of expertise, um, but it's also about understanding what uh, dynamic we need to create in order to have this ability to innovate, right? I think we all have this willingness to innovate. We all want to do that. And in a lot of cases, our organizations have that purpose. We have the right values. We have the uh, rules of engagement, um, but then thinking through, you know, sometimes it makes it hard because there is sort of um, uh, a tension there when it comes to truly being an innovative community. We need to be able to create that abrasion, um, you know, agility and resolution, and uh, that way that we communicate needs to be uh, taught, right, and it needs to be embraced. Um, and so sometimes it's important to think about it from that context. Are we training our leaders and our workforce to be innovative? So some tactics to encourage this uh, disruptive thinking, um, assume we're incorrect, right? Always challenge the things we know. Uh, continue to be open to new ideas. Um, encourage a dissent. I like this idea of designating the devil's advocate. Sometimes, you know, that has, can be annoying but it does help to change our mindset and remind ourselves to change our mindset. Certainly diversity and inclusion is huge. Um, idea competitions are great, right? And I know a lot of agencies are looking at that and broadening the who we are, uh, a, who is included as part of that competition. Um, and so I'm gonna post this on the ESIP website as we talked about, so I won't read all of this, but this will be available to you guys to take away. And then for the future of work, like I mentioned, right, we need to think about um, how do we improve employee collaboration, especially in the context of potentially us not all coming back to work in person. Um, 
and creating those environments so that when we do come back together, we're optimizing that engagement, right? And we are creating opportunities for us to continue to be creative and innovative. So final thoughts, so I can leave you guys time for questions. Um, you know, innovation, it doesn't magically happen. I think we all know that it requires continuous action and effort on all of our parts. Um, you know, we talk about this uh, failing fast and it is a tolerance for failure and having that safety culture where we can fail, but it's no tolerance for incompetence, right? So we can't, we have to be skilled, we have to be disciplined. And, you know, in order to go fast, we can't break things along the way. So we wanna go fast, but we wanna maintain that stability. A willingness to be to experiment, but still have that high discipline, right? Especially when we're talking about production environments and operations where, you know, the in the case of like unified forecasting, uh, we, we can't, those systems can't go down, right? So how do we experiment in a way that maintains that integrity in the operational uh, realm? Uh, we want psychological safety, but we need to be able to be brutally candid. We need to be able to be open and upfront about what's going wrong and how we can change it and have that environment that's available to us. Um, we want collaboration, but I mentioned, right, we need individual accountability because the individual at the end of the day needs to deliver the thing that we're trying to do. And we, uh, so we need to maintain that um, flat but strong leadership. So we talk about transformational leadership and having uh, you know, leadership that's promoting this environment and culture constantly. Um, so ability to change, probably the most important trait that we can build upon in our organizations and communities. Um, we do sometimes lean on what we know and we need to change that mindset as much as possible and just be aware that we have that bias. Um, and then, realizing that it's going to take time right at the end of the day and we need to train everybody on this new way of thinking if we are changing it and it, it might be subtle right it might be a subtle change and it needs to be communicated clearly so that everybody understands where we're heading so i really appreciate everybody's time today and the opportunity to talk to you about, and i look forward to the questions so back to you megan on uh, where we are with questions Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Collins. Um, would you mind uh, ending your screen share? Of course. Uh, it's sometimes nice if folks want to turn on their cameras just for the more uh, discussion-centric part. But yes, thank you so much for that deep dive into you know what innovation means from your perspective. I really uh, need to get a, a hold on your slides because there's so much in there um, I think we can all learn from. I appreciated your point, especially about um, cultivating not just the willingness, but the ability to innovate and, and what that really means. So the chat box has been blowing up with questions um, and I encourage other folks to continue to add them and we will make sure that you get a response whether or not it fits in the next 10 minutes um, of this webinar. But I'd like to start it off with um, Ryan McGranigan's question about um, the training ecosystem and sort of the portfolio of training materials or approaches that you referred to sort of early on in your talk. Yeah, great question, Ryan. So I would say that the training um, takes a variety of forms. I think it's uh, sort of a self-service platform where you know there's videos, there's uh, webinars, there's papers and books that are freely available to, to the community that, that, that you want this available to, um, in addition to right, um, classes. Uh, and I think in terms of topics, in, from your, back to your second question on the portfolio, um, it's everything across the, uh, what I call that digital transformation framework. So we wanna teach the technologies for sure. Um, and we wanna teach the methodologies as well. And so um, I think both of those need to be focused on in order to ensure that we're not only learning the what and the how, uh, or we're learning the, the what, the how, the why, all of it together, uh, because all of that matters, you know, in terms of the delivery of that innovation. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. So next up, we had a question from Rob Casey. It seems to be about scale. So would it make sense to teach upstart data repositories and compute sensors to design their architectures at various tiers? Um, many times prescribed best practices prove to be difficult for a small group to realize with small staff levels, budgets, and use case needs. So what's an approach for both large and small facilities? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point because I, I, I can appreciate that, um, you know, for small groups, you know, there's only so much you can do. So I think certainly this is where the partnership comes into play, right? So when I talked about that innovation stakeholder 
leveraging what other larger organizations are doing and partnering with them. I know for SAIC, you know, this is a huge area for us. Um, you know, we can't be the innovative organization that we are by ourselves. Um, and so partnering with small teams, with small businesses, we pride ourselves on our ability to do that. And certainly with even startups, you know, as I mentioned, um, and it's huge, it's a complete win-win in terms of creating um, environments where we can learn from each other and share resources. Um, let's see, you had a lot to unpack in your questions. So I wanna make sure that, that I, I address all of it. Um, I mean, I guess bottom line is, is definitely, you know, partnerships are huge and every large agency, government agency, um, you know, has these opportunities to share. I think we can do a better job. Um, and also I think it's incumbent on the small businesses to the smaller teams to be clear with what they need because sometimes large businesses have a hard time understanding, you know, what the challenges are. And so the clearer we know what the need is from the community, we can figure out ways to plan for providing those resources to the community as well. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you so much. All right, next up, we had a question from Susan Shingledecker. In DevOps product teams models, can you talk to building teams with diverse skill sets or how to bridge teams of teams that bring different skills or technical specialties together in a cohesive way to solve a challenge in a multi-dimensional manner? Yeah, this is, uh, I love this question and um, it's challenging. Um, you know, I can tell you my experience with NASA, um, you know, cause I think NASA has continued to, to figure out, right, this, this cross-functional team because it's so important for the mission. It's important for IT, um, but you know, fiefdoms do exist, right? And they do develop. And so breaking down those models and bringing the teams together is, is a challenge. Um, I think the, the best way is to sort of, uh, you know, I think Simon Sinek and his start, start with the why, right? Ensuring that we have a clear purpose, a clear why um, really has the, the power to bring the groups together. Um, and then maintaining sort of, you know, we talked about individual accountability, right? We, everybody needs to sort of uh, still have sort of their individual definition of, of what they're bringing to the team or just, creating this new purpose that we're all coming together in a different way. Um, so I think clarity of purpose, clarity of the problem that we're trying to solve and having sort of that, um, that higher purpose, right, is what brings us together. Um, and and that's, that's not easy to do. So I don't mean to sort of give such a simplistic answer, uh, but I do think that that's how, how we uh, are successful with the new model. All right, we have a couple of questions from Tim Ortiz uh, regarding startup culture and what that looks like. Is that culture in place on day one or is it something a startup evolves? And once there should there be an exit strategy, what is the follow on culture, whether there is growth or additional innovation? Great question, Tim. Um, so certainly, um, you know, it's not on day one. I think, you know, there's a danger too in you know, we say start where we are, right? And, and that's important. But sometimes, you know, if we do start small, uh, we can almost create this cultural debt, right? Where we have just this group that's working like a startup or working in DevOps. And um, that tends to stifle uh, innovation across the, the, the community and across the, the enterprise. So I would say um, we need to think broadly, but then start where we are. Um, and it does take time. Um, and it does take sort of the um, socialization, like it's almost like there's more work to be done because we do need to socialize it with all of the stakeholders and make sure everybody is on board um, in order for uh, it to work fully. And, you know, I would certainly uh, have checkpoints because to your point, you know, is there, should there be an exit strategy? I think there's, there is a point where maybe this is, you know, it's not going the right way and we need to try a different way. And then we need to be able to pivot so that we're not, you know, pouring resources and money into something that's not achieving the value. So going back to, are we getting what we want out of this initiative or not is important. All right, Tim's second question. Um, he argues that uh, discovered that you were innovative should be another category in addition to mm. the willingness and an ability. Um, 
and abilities. So um, if you accept this, what would you su suggest for a team to sort of achieve? How do they discover that they were innovative? That's interesting. Um, so I guess just to be clear, Tim, and you know, you're, you're cut off from asking questions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, you, you want to say retrospectively, how can we discover that something was indeed innovative? And I think that you know, the methodology that we talk about with respect to DevOps and agility inherent in that is the retrospective. Um, so I think even though we kind of, you know, go into things wanting to be innovative in the retrospective, we can analyze were we innovative and maybe even discover through that process that, you know, maybe we weren't innovative in the initial problem that we were trying to solve, but we did create other innovations that now apply to other problems. So hopefully I think that addresses what you are talking about. Um, but I think that constant feedback and feedback from everybody in the community, right? We, I think Annie and I talked about this before we got started here, right? Being, um, having that thicker skin and uh, constantly asking for input and feedback is so important. I mean, it's important in science. It's important in what we're trying to do here with innovation. Wonderful. Okay, there's one question left in the chat box and we have about one minute left. So can you talk about brutally candid and no tolerance for incompetence um, being at odds with psychologically safe work culture? How can we view this discrepancy? How yeah, great question, Rob. And, and something that is sort of uh, intellectually at odds with, you know, with uh, what we're trying to do here. So the, the point is that we want psychological safety we definitely want everybody to be empowered to come up with new ideas. Um, but we want to ensure that everybody is maintaining uh, the skills and level of discipline that's required to do the job that we're all here to do. All of this and what we're talking about, I think like requires everybody in the organization to sort of uh, raise the bar right on expectations. And um, so, you know, I think, you know, I read it in multiple articles on, on innovation and studies on innovation that, you know, the most successful organizations, while everybody feels psychologically safe, that the communication can be pretty, uh, it's very candid and we need to be brutally candid in order to ensure that uh, we're pushing each other to do, you know, that, and that we're maintaining security and that we're yeah. maintaining that high operational discipline but that can be in a psychologically safe environment. So we just need to sort of change our mindset around, you know, we can't always be sort of uh, nurturing in our communications all the time if we need to be absolutely clear that this is the way that things need to get done. Um, and the no tolerance for incompetence, I think, you know, all of our agencies will agree that we can't, there's, there's just operational environments where we can't make mistakes, right? The mission cannot fail. Um, and you know, there's huge consequences as a result for that sort of thing. So that just needs to, again, become part of the culture uh, and where we can still feel psychologically safe, but understand that we can't make a mistake, um, that we can fail, but we need to learn from that failure. And it needs to be more of that, we're planning for the failure as opposed to, we just, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. Thank you very much, Dr. Collins. We really uh, crammed in a lot of good answers to questions in those last 10 minutes. I look forward to sharing the slides and the recording with everyone after the meeting. Um, but thank you again for speaking today. Thank you to SAIC for supporting this webinar series. Thank you to all of our attendees for participating and asking great questions. Uh, this concludes our webinar for today. We'll be back in April with another webinar to be announced shortly. There are a lot of great ideas in the pipeline and we welcome you to share additional ideas with us if you have them. Um, and finally, one note to stay up to date on all things ESIP, including the announcement of our next webinar, updates on the ESIP summer meeting, please subscribe to our Monday update mailing list. And like I said, you can view this recording on the ESIP YouTube channel shortly. Thanks everyone.